So my name's Tina, or the Finnish girl, and I speak kind of a Spanglish, Catalanglish, and Finglish <laughs> with a beautiful accent, probably. And I've been for a time living here, and if you don't mind, I'll switch to English or maybe some Catalan as well. Add it in Catalan English, whatever. Um. Um, okay, I I work in a university of Uvascula, easy, um, in the middle of Finland, and at the moment I'm in one project called Systemic Learning Solutions. Um, which is funded by the Finnish Funding Agency for Technology and Innovation. Um, we participate with uh, Asian countries, with uh, Hispanic countries, Spain and Chile, and then with one Arabic country, United Arab Emirates. And one thing we're doing, we are comparing um, educational technology in these countries so as to understand what is global and, on the other hand, what is, cl what is local globalization and localization needs. And what is very typical for this kind of um, research, and in Finland in general, we collaborate with um, companies, schools, and research institutes. Because we think this is, well, we, we call it value network. We think that e each participant has to add some, some kind of value this, to this collaboration. And this is actually, well, it's called Learning Solution Program, uh, funded by, the, by the, uh, this Finnish funding agency for technology and innovation. And there are also other value networks with the same idea, collaboration between different stakeholders. And, okay, we also collabor collaborate with the Ministry of Education in Finland, and they sent their greetings. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here, but don't worry, I mean, I'm going to be president of Finland in five years anyway, so... So you have me, <laughs> but, but they re we have elections coming next month, so that's why there couldn't be anyone from there. But I spoke with the senior advisor, uh, Jouni Kangasniemi, who has a long history in educational technology in Finland, and, and he sent his greetings, and I was asking him, like, what are the hottest things at the moment in Finland, and he... Uh, well, he mentioned um, <coughs> the national core curriculum, which we are going to update in 2016. Uh, well, the old curriculum we have, the current curriculum is from 2004, which tells something about Finns. We are quite slow in changing, but we are changing, but little by little. And in this curriculum, we have computational thinking and coding as a part of the curriculum. And then also the final examinations for the upper secondary schools are going to be digitalized starting from, from next year, gradually, Finnish way. And then other thing we are working hard in Finland is EduCloud Alliance, and this is collaboration with Estonia, and well, it has to do with open source materials, interoperability, and the Minister of Education is taking care of uh, making sure that it's going to be easy to use for schools. There's going to be like a bazaar for peer-reviewed um, materials that you can share and comment. And then there's going to be like a space where you can get inspired, like good practices, sharing good practices. And then there's going to be a part for know-how, like a gamified information, peer support, questions, answers, and so on. This, is, this EduCloud Alliance is one very big project in Finland going on. Okay, so this was my greetings from Finland. And now I think it's time for each panelist to, to present themselves. And I mean, your interest, if you like, or if you invented a new cooking recipe or something, <laughs> you know, go ahead. Here we start with you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adrian Godfrey. I'm the director of uh, mobile learning at the GSMA. And welcome to our Mobile World Congress. Um, I'm a passionate believer that technology has a huge part to play in uh, learning transformation, whether it's formal, informal, or part of skills development. Uh, but only one part. There are many, many more parts, and I hope we get a chance to cover them all quite thoroughly on this panel. Um, my past experience is working with Cisco, so I've worked on international education transformation programs 
uh, in countries such as um, uh, Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, and areas uh, such as Rajasthan, and Mississippi, and Louisiana. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I say uh, thank you very much to Mobile World Conference to uh, give me the, the opportunity to stay here today. Um, I change, I parlare català después de fer la salutació. So after my greetings, let me switch into Catalan. Good morning to you all, and thank you for having invited me to participate. My name is Mauricio Sanchez Bert. I'm a professor at the Rovira and Virgili University in Tarragona, a pedagogue and an expert in applied technologies to the world of education. I'm coordinating our GET, a research group, research group in technology and education. This is an interdisciplinary group where we work on the implementation of technologies in the educational world. In recent years, our latest projects have been focused on the use of 3D environments for training, specifically in training in digital competencies for the faculty, for the teachers. And recently, on research, we've been looking on the digital competence of the teachers. Thank you very much, Marce. Since we'll be using names, Adrian, now Marce, and now it's Carlos and Steven, rather than the family names, we'll be using the names. So, my name is Carlos Suero. I'm the headmaster of the Pervergés School in Badalona. We started some three years ago a relevant project back then on implementing and rolling out iPads, over 1,500 devices. Now, this doesn't seem to be that relevant, given that so many people use their iPads. We don't speak that much about technology, but I mean it positively, because we have extended and we have spread the use of these technological devices. And let me look at this thing from a different approach. I was a teacher myself of chemistry. Then I did one thing that you, we usually teachers don't do. We, I acted as a consultant at international projects, and now I'm back as a headmaster. And Tina used to tell me, well, introduce yourself as a headmaster or even as a father. Uh, I've had four children myself, so I could speak about that. But rather, I decided I would introduce myself as a brother and as a plane pilot. L let me tell you why, because I have a uh, brother of mine who's a plane pilot, and he often brags about it in saying, he, I've been flying for 5,000 hours, you know, because it's a competitive world. And so I once counted the amount of hours I had been teaching, and given the CO2 levels in the classroom that we were seeing before, maybe I've spent some 8,000 hours in a classroom. And I mean it, but humbly. Uh, and there are people that have been doing so for 40 years, so maybe 30,000 hours, flight hours, or <laughs> classroom hours. So if we were to count the hours, and I know that many of you have been for long in the classrooms, breathing CO2 and so on, that the message I'd like to uh, get through is that we, I believe that in these kind of meetings, we are privileged to be able to attend these type of seminars, and yet, there is always the same of us. It's always the same faces around. And indeed, what we might say seems reasoned enough, seems sensible enough. I think that we will all agree on what might be good for a school. So our professional and moral duty is that whatever is going on in here is really translated into the classrooms so that tomorrow when we're back to our schools, we try and spread these best practices around and this becoming more mainstream and not just one flash in the pan. And maybe later on we can go into further discussion. You want to take the cram parents robe? Or? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm here as a granddad. I'm kind of rather proud of that. I, um, I, I taught for a long time. I started teaching in East London and uh, in South London in, in in really tough schools, but I enjoyed it enormously. And um, of course, what you see is amazing. Very good children for whom everything has, has failed. When it does work, you see amazing um, uh, progress. I set up a charity. We were looking after a thousand children a year who had been excluded from school. So these are children who had been expelled for school for well serious things, really. Um, they never. 
They never talked much about what it was, but it was always bad, you know. And one of the surprises with the project was those children outperformed the schools they'd been thrown out of. So as a cohort of a thousand children, they did better than any of the schools that had thrown them out. And, you know, it's a, it's a salutary lesson, I think, for us. If, if the children for whom everything has failed can do better than the children for whom everything is working, how badly are we doing for the children for whom everything's working? And I think, you know, I think I'm not complacent. Um, one of the nice things about my life is, you know, I'm working in Australia, in the Caribbean, in, in Scandinavia, in Southeast Asia. And I think the two differences I notice around the world are that for Singapore and China and India and much of the Pacific Rim, they look at education and they say, how can we invest? Where can we spend money that will be better for us as citizens in the future? I think in Europe, we say, how can we reduce the cost? You know, uh, education is a cost to be mitigated. For mo much of the rest of the world, it's an investment to be maximized. And the ones who are investing keep investing because they're getting their money back. That's the thing. You know, there. And, you know, it's quite interesting to think if, if all of you, if you improve your schools dramatically, everybody saves money apart from you. You know, the, the police force, they need less policemen to patrol the town because your children are better. And one of my schools on the south coast of England had the highest rate of teenage pregnancy in, I think, the south of the country before we started. So huge numbers of our girls were becoming pregnant. Since we opened, none have. So think of the savings to the health service. But the police force don't arrive and give us a police car. The health service don't arrive and give us all the money they've saved. So when we do well in education, everybody else does well, but somehow it doesn't join up. We keep doing it because we see the outcome in the children. For a lot of the rest of the world, when education does well, education gets more funding. And I believe that will change in Europe. I think you'll see that change quite quickly. So, yeah. Okay, so that was our warming up. Um, so I just forgot to say that we invited here people representing different perspectives, and I'm sure you noticed that already. I was thinking maybe I can be a learner. So if you're industry... Yes. Oh, no, we're research. all learners. There's no... <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, lifelong learners. We're all learners. And, and some of us are parents, some are grandparents, some are researchers, industry, teaching uh, directors. So we try to take like, different perspectives and, and talk about challenges and, and differences in views, but also we try to be, well, find solutions and be positive, optimistic about the possibilities we have when collaborating with different stakeholders. And, and I was just laughing that I, I tweeted a picture of all of you there because it's easy to do a panorama on the chair. And I'm just <laughs> laughing that you tweeted back a picture of us up here. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, here we have the results of the, the votation. And the winner is... <laughs> Winner is most of the votes went to the, um, wait a minute, I can't see, teacher competencies. So the idea is that we start talking about the teacher competencies support need first, and then we continue talking about the, the second mo most voted with, uh, t theme, which is the digitalization of teaching and learning materi materials, followed by flipped classroom, and then personalized mobile learning, uh, students as co-designers of learning and rethinking the role of teachers, if we have time for all that. But, but the idea is as well that um, we, we can, um, well, you can have your comments from the panel, but we also would like you to, to participate. Let's make it really interactive between, with the audience as well. Okay, so if we start with the, um, with the teacher competencies, I think Merce has quite a lot to say, maybe from the research perspective. Mm -hmm. So if you could start, what have you been working? I'll begin with an anecdote. Some three, four weeks ago, 
in the Basque Country government, they invited me to make a presentation, a speech, at a seminar they were organizing on a program, let's call a digital illiteracy program for the Basque Country. And my participation was related to digital competences for the teachers. And I guess some of you may know me, and you believe that I'm quite radical in my views sometimes. So at a given point in time during my presentation, I said that the digital illiterates would have no place in the education system, that the educational environment required the best teachers, and of course, they needed to be digitally competent. And then there was an old lady in the room, I mean, old 60, 60 odd, I mean, an old, old, I mean, some of you may love us, and maybe not that old, I mean, she felt like she was old, but after I finished my presentation, there was a panel discussion on people representing different departments at the past country, and the representatives of the health department was hard at me. I, I was strong in my position. And then that old lady raised her hand and said, I can see that I can go back home because I have no place, given, given what you said. And, and she felt like she was being embarrassed and feeling sad. And let me answer what I told her back then. In that digital competence, there is one thing, which is an attitude, and then the behavior and then the competence but then the behavior the attitude is what's important the way you approach your reality in learning in teaching your students because of course we live in a digital environment and it seems obvious that no matter how many research is done on digital competences for teachers there is roughly some 50 percent of the present teachers that see themselves as not being competent enough and therefore that would be that cap, that ceiling, that glass ceiling that we should try and break from in order to try to have an, a, a different perception of things because reality might be different and we might just have to sort out with the, our perception of things. So let me say that I feel privileged in the possibility to work along these lines from different standpoints. First, on from research, because that's part of my university task, and we have three ongoing projects targeting at defining what the digital competence for teachers should be and how to be assessed. Then I'm also a member of the interdepartment task force created recently in the Catalan government that will try and find a way to validate the initial assessment of the teachers and also to show that the ones that are doing their job are also digitally competent. Some six months ago, I also participated at the Fundacio Bufil Foundation, and after producing a report, a report that can be downloaded, by the way, this is a report I coordinated together with Miguel Angel Prats from Blancarna University and Nati Carrera from Wok University, the Open University where we tried to review our setting, to map out our setting, considering what would be the mobile penetration and what would be the experiences and future proposals and on the short term regarding the use of mobile devices. And I'm also a member of the Schools Council of Catalonia, and therefore I feel part and parcel of the paper that was just uh, introduced a few moments ago by Mr. Roos and trying to provide some guidelines on things to be done. But without taking too much time, a couple or three ideas. First, on starting training, we should reassess, rethink the whole digital training, and we are doing so in one of our meetings for this task force, for this commission. One more thing, and teachers, you should be leading the learning process. And, and you are, but often you are not recognized as such or you are not able to showcase that. So if the, we have a digital society, we need digital education because we are preparing these people for the future. And finally, in the case of Catalonia, 
we should have some more research on what needs to be done and how is it done. And researching means often just documenting what we might already be doing. In this uh, schools council paper that was introduced, we've been asking who's doing things with mobile devices. Well, plenty of schools are doing so. And I, I think that this is probably a tradition in that we do not tend to explain what we are already doing. So I would invite you, I would suggest you to tell about the things that you're already doing, maybe just in a blog or your website and or later tweet it so that we can get to know it. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos, would you like to add something? I'm, I'm really happy to have this topic as the first topic. It was the key topic in my view. Regarding teachers' competences, rather than speaking about specific competences, I would speak about the general teacher's competences and what's expected from a teacher. And as Antoni Savala, the Catalan pedagogue, would put it, the thing is, are we looking for as strategic teachers or specifying teachers? I mean, the or implementing teachers. The implementing teacher would be the one that is just implementing things based on a handbook or a textbook. And, and there are very good implementing teachers. And then on the other end, you have the strategist, the one that it's not just an implementer because there comes a time when you have to execute. But then on Saturdays, Sundays, they may sit down and they may plan things. They may sequence things. They may design activities and so on. This is the strategist. And apparently it doesn't seem that clear yet what we are looking for. What's clear yet is that the implementer and the planner or the strategist are two different things. As an implementer myself, I can have, let's say, 30 hours in classroom. I can have the math handbook, and that's about it. And as a planner or as a strategist, the problem definition is quite different. The experience we've seen in the case of the secondary school in Tarragona, that's the experience of a true strategist, of a true planner. If we're looking for that, then the competences are quite different. It, these are added on to the implementer. As an implementer, you have just the school's competences. And as a planner, as a strategist, you require a different professional. But the change is outstanding, spectacular. The problem lies in translating what the individual is into what the school is looking for. And we have major projects at schools, um, but the thing is how you might say, no, we do so on a generalized basis. No, we are doing this on a generalized basis. So uh, I think that this debate is fundamental. And I'm sure that the teacher that came and introduced that example before, and she was a strategist, is probably devoting more hours than any other consultant that you might think about. I'm pretty much convinced about it. And this is a main uh, view and my main question. Don't agree at all. That was a joke. <laughs> I think we, well, maybe, yeah, you want to add there something? And then maybe if somebody from the audience uh, after you would like to say something to this theme, we open the discussion to the audience. But please, Stephen. I just want to say two, two things, really. Um, the, the first is, you know, when you look around our communities, I don't know where any, anywhere other than a school where we have a, a community of postgraduate qualified people focusing on anything as complex as learning. You know, it's not in our retail stores, it's not in our churches anymore, it's not in our banks, I can't say that without laughing. Uh, you know, our, our teachers are the beating intellectual heart of our communities. So the question here is, who should they listen to in move, moving forward? And just um, a few days ago on Facebook, I had a, a colleague um, reflecting on the journey of his research paper as he, in a university. I'm a professor in three universities, so I was sympathetic. He, um, he did, the research in 19, uh, did the research in 2009 to 2011. He wrote up the research in 2012, submitted it to a journal. They wrote back in 2014 and asked for some edits, which he made. And this year, he's heard his paper has been accepted for publication next year. So he started the research before the iPhone was invented, 
during the research, the iPad was invented, so were all the other tablets, and it won't be published until after the Apple phone is ubiquitous. So it's pretty clear, I think, that as teachers, we won't be going to professors and to university research departments to keep up to date. But I do know that around the world, teachers are getting on with it. If I go to UK Ed Chat, you know, every Thursday night on Twitter between eight o'clock and nine o'clock, thousands of teachers focused on technology and PE, low level behavior with discipline. And I know that a lot of the teachers there tune into the OzEd chat where classroom teachers are swapping their, not their opinions, but their research and their reflections and their data and their certainty. And better still, the <coughs> kids are doing it too. I helped set up Teachers TV in England. We had um, 5,000 television programs, a dedicated channel for teachers by teachers, but it had a quarter of a million children a week watching Teachers TV watching programs about how to teach better. Going into school and saying, I've seen this program on maths teaching. Would you watch it, please? <laughs> really, you know, <laughs> would you watch it soon? You know? <laughs> so I think the answer here is quite clear. As a community of learning professionals, we should trust ourselves and our students. It was rebuilding a space in, funnily enough, in the set Catalonia here with a group of children, one of them said to me, he said, you know, I've been in seven schools in my life. This is the first time somebody's asked me how it could be done better. And he leaned, he leaned forward and he said, and I've always known. Now, we're not asking kids, we're not asking teachers for their opinion. We're asking them to look at all the components of other people's learning and think how that will make a good local local recipe. But last thing, but for example, it's really hard as a teacher on your own, in a room, with the door shut, to learn from others. Someone in the audience. And, and we know that if we've got three teachers in a shared space, you know, where one's leading, one's stretching, one's intervening to help, those three teachers working in parallel, doing what one teacher does in series but quicker, also learn from each other. So all that, you know, you're here together as a community, trust yourselves, don't trust your opinions, trust your research and make sure the kids are part of it. You can't build better learning for the kids in Catalonia, it can't be done. But you can build better learning with the kids in Catalonia and you can do it right now. That's the difference. Do we have any comments from the audience? Questions, comments? Uh, do you think what, what Stephen says uh, would work in Catalonia? Well, it works everywhere in the yeah. world. Yeah, it I'm even just works like, in Somali, where they're all pirates. Yeah, you know. yeah I'm just <laughs> trying to take some like a cultural differences. Do you think there's some? Well, you're better at recipes. That's the thing. I mean, you know, you should be better able than anybody in the world to reach out for that ingredient. This, this is not science. You can't have a control group of kids. If I give this lot of kids iPads, and I don't give this lot iPads, you know, they're changed. They're anger, resentment, jealousy. This is engineering. You know, if when they flew to the moon the first time, they'd have done a literature research on, okay, who else has been to the moon? Let's see what they've done. Nobody would have gone. It's engineering. They said, what do we need to know to get to the moon? We need to know about velocity, gravity, energy, we need to know physics, you know. Let's take all those things and let's fly to the moon, you know. You could build the best learning in the world, but not by waiting for somebody else to do it and then hoping you can copy it. That ain't gonna work. Yeah, comments? Is there? Yeah, please, over there. Can you pass the microphone? Or the lady, yeah? Mm. If you can introduce yourself and, yeah, thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, I, make, I have a question which it's the one that bothers me more about this topic, which is there's so, the, the technology is going so fast. And teachers, we are mostly, we are grown up, so we, we, our brain doesn't go so fast. <laughs> Most of the teachers we have learned 
from reading from books. The best of us, maybe we have understood before, we memorized. The process of learning about technology, about mobiles, about all this stuff, is learning by doing most of it. So this is a real big change in the teacher's lives. So what I understand that they sometimes they wait for being trained by someone which it doesn't exist. It's like you just have to jump into the swimming pool. So my question is, how can we help those teachers to feel com comfortable and confident in front of this big ocean? And um, how can we make good decisions? Because like just by choosing the device we, you want to use, sometimes this is difficult. So thank you very much. Thank you. Who wants to come on for that? I think that the answer doesn't uh, relate to technology. We were talking about professional skills before, earlier. We always insist uh, on the fact that in a classroom participation beats silence. It is zero entropy. There is no disorder, no complexity, and it needs professional, specific professional skills that are very few from the teacher. Now, we teachers are asked to do something totally different. It is managing complexity created in the classroom. It implies a group of students in the corridor, people moving around, interaction, uh, people working in the garden, in the corridor, in the court. Technology in complex setup. We may have uh, complex systems. 30 years ago, methodology was very interaction-based, interactive, and it uh, requested a high uh, pool of professional uh, skills. Uh, technology complex setup for us. There is a highly technical uh, uh, place uh, for us right now. So technology implies that the zero entropy system is broken, it's left behind. It implies disruption in our traditional pattern of teaching as teachers. So it takes uh, from us some skills that go even beyond managing technology in the classroom. They relate to how we manage a group of students. Some in the department in a conference, Joanna Ferre told us uh, in the classroom there are various skills available. Uh, there are various skills together with various styles, various spaces, various uh, speeds. And you don't see it with zero entropy models. It flow, This pops up when the uh, environment is uh, technical, when there is disorder, disruption there. Uh, I think that we have to re-engineer the way we teach our uh, training for teachers and a, a bottom-up approach because technology will change the setting for us for good for life. I do agree with uh, Carles, and uh, I feel that sometimes we play up the role played by technology. And I myself have been dealing with a way to introduce technology in education in the school for a long time. In itself, technology doesn't change anything at all. Methodology changes the way we feel about how learning goes. Our ability to approach the diversity in the classroom, the main, this is the main challenge. Whether we pick up a mobile or a tablet or a PC, it makes no difference. Or you would just go out into the yard, into the, cor into the courtyard, for instance, uh, a case of mine. Again, I teach pedagogy, education, and uh, there are interns. I had to monitor interns working in a school. There are two ways to approach it. It is uh, five-year-olds, four-year-olds uh, classrooms in the morning. I went to the uh, herbal Garden. It is based on participation by students, students outside, uh, teachers dealing with them, the um, little boys and girls moving around inside, outside the garden. There is a small garden in the back room. In the afternoon, one girl who had an activity in PDE and was up. To, what do you think about it? And I wasn't able to answer her until uh, next day because it was, very, it was very late for me to watch the PDF. She is starting, this girl, but using the PDF told her, just to shut up and look at the screen. Silence, keep mum. If you don't keep mum, you, you go into the corridor. You are arrested for some time. PDE 
didn't input anything. It was just watching something on the screen. So uh, it implies that the challenge is, as Carla said at the beginning, this is the challenge. Which type of teacher we want to be? or we want to have in the system, and which are the privileges given to him. For instance, using technical tools. We live in a digital society. Let's recall that. Let's keep it in mind. The quid is not that, the power of technology to change things, but it is the way we behave inside this teaching process and helping others learn more and better. Yeah, just I mean, very quickly. You have to be a geek. You're a learning professional. And you don't have to be like all the other teachers either. Let me just explain that a little. If you're, you're standing in the playground and a kid goes past on a skateboard and they jump, the skateboard comes off the, off the floor, turns, lands, the kid lands on it, You can tell them an awful lot about physics from that. There's Newtonian law, equal and opposite. You could maybe get into a conversation about media and um, back to the future and hoverboards. There's a whole lot of things as a learning professional you can draw out of that. If you get on the skateboard, you'll probably kill yourself. So you don't have to be better than the kids at technology. You know, if they're writing, they're doing narrative, I don't care whether they're doing it on you know, on Facebook or they're doing it on a blog or you can advise them about narrative. If they're building uh, thought patterns, you can show them how to do that. If you're a PE special, sports specialist, you know how they're using technology in your subject, but you don't need to know how they use it in other subjects. So be good at what you're good at and let them be better than you with the technology is fine. In the end of the 19th 90s, I surveyed a little research project. We surveyed 2,000 people and asked them about their best ever learning experience. And it was pretty much an unashamed constructivist model of learning that emerged. They learned from doing things, they did it with others, they had an audience and celebration, the learning was always hard, and they felt that ipsitive referencing of their own progress going forward, and all that was predictable. But there was always a teacher, coach, parent present, and those people were a little eccentric. They remembered them fondly because they were crazy about poetry. They were obsessed with chemistry. They were frankly a bit odd about physics, you know. And they remembered the, the teachers as being differently passionate about their subject. What worries me about a lot of the CPD I see The teachers come out thinking they've got to be the same as all the others. Exactly the opposite is true. You've got to come out as you and show how you, with your eccentricities and your passion, how you use technology, and it's going to be different from other people. That helps kids build that model. And by the way, somebody said, it might have been you in your question, that people get a bit slow as they get older. The good news about the research is your ability to pattern match and make sense of chaos peaks at about 74. So if you don't kind of wreck yourself, you're going to get sharper and sharper and sharper. And that diagnostic ability is key in the classroom. We're very lucky in the classroom at the moment. We have a generation of young teachers who came in during full employment. You remember that, it wasn't so long ago. They could choose to be anything they liked. They chose to be teachers. And then right at the end of their career, We've got people who came in when we were still really making, making up education. When I started teaching, we wrote the exams every year. We wrote our own exams, and each year we said, right, what are we going to do different? So you've got the kind of wise old owls who are used to change every year and teachers who really want to teach. And we've got them together for about another 10 years. So the other thing I'd say is try and build teams of young and old because, in my experience, they're the best in getting things done. Okay, thank you. I, I think a couple of things, if we sum up this discussion, we, the, what comes to the attitudes is that we, well, like we said, we are all learners, lifelong learners, and so 
So this attitude of learning with students, learning with your colleagues, learning from the industry, learn, you know, I think it's, it's, one, it's a key to a success. Every, every company in Catalonia, for sure, every company in Europe that I've seen would declare themselves as being a learning organization. They have a mission statement that mentions, a mission statement that mentions learning, but they don't know how to learn. They know how to do training. They've got some bloke in the basement with a filing cabinet full of video discs, you know. So there's a really good dialogue to be had here between parents and families for whom learning is really cool because television is full of learning, children who are hungry to learn better, companies who know they need to learn to survive but don't know how to do it, and schools who need to go to move forward to survive. And suddenly, we're all on the same page. I've never known that in, in 40 years of my career. It's a great time. Okay. Yeah, maybe we go to the next page, which is the digitalization of teaching and learning materials. Just a tiny comment here, because people often look at Nordic countries or the Finland. They think Finland is, well, because of the PISA results, that they're doing so well. But I, I just wanted to comfort that with this issue, we are all equally struggling. Like um, in Finland, well, we have five million people and um, uh, learning materials are sold about 90 million of euros every year and only like um, a few percent of these amounts are digital materials. So in Scandinavia, in Finland, we still have this culture of using books. If you think that we are somehow advanced in some sense, uh, in, in this sense, no, we, we still love books. And, but we, we know, for example, what happened to music industry. It was all first physical albums, and then suddenly nobody bought physical albums anymore. So music industry had to change. And, and there's something going on at the moment that maybe in education we could learn from other industries. Or um, would you comment? Would you like to say something sure. related to digitalization? Absolutely. First of all, I really don't like the title. I think the worst thing we could do is digitize everything we have, which is what that, that title sort of implies. Um, uh, and I had a session last year here at Congress, and I deliberately invited two large publishers, Pearson and Oxford University Press. And half the objective was to challenge them. You've created the market. You've served that market for many years and made good money. You're the enterprise that's addressing the needs for the next 10, 20 years. Yet you don't understand the digital marketplace. You have no strategy. You're busy milking the market as you see it at the moment. So somebody has to lead in this space, and it's really a shame if it's not the publishers. However, um, very good point by Stephen. One of the most powerful things we have as educators is our own networks. And we've had some incredible successes in creating environments, social environments, where teachers can create, co-create, peer review, publish, and share. And this, for me, is, is the ideal application of technology. If you have a broken process, something that's bad, a bad workflow, bad process, you add technology, it becomes worse. If you've got something that's fantastic, which is the collaboration of teachers, the inspiration of school leaders, then you find something to make that better, then we all win. And then you can really start to look where things are, are, are very, very apparent. The ubiquity of the English language, Spanish language, other languages, and then suddenly the learning becomes much broader than the classroom, the school, the school district, the county, the state, and the nation, it becomes global which is fantastic. And we've all seen the business models emerging from Facebook and Google. This is what I want to see. The power harnessed of the intelligent and collaborative teachers that we have. And Stephen's point, I hadn't really realized. There's this unique tipping point where we have a, 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 two generations of teachers that complement each other. Let's harness that power with technology, underwrite it with stuff that's really easy to learn because we use it in our lives. Use the devices that are absolutely ubiquitous, phones, tablets, community uh, technology, and really see if we can drive the revolution in, in digitized learning objects. Yeah. 
Is there any comments from the audience? Any challenges over here or questions? Here is one gentleman. Can you keep your hand up? Okay. Hola, buen día. John. Good afternoon. My name is Alpera. I'm principal of a high school. I did like it. I did like two remarks. I think that you, Stephen, you were talking about the case that in order to, to you were talking about throwing children into the swimming pool to make them uh, uh, swim. You, Carlos, you said that you have been managing human resources or you were contracting people, I think you said, if I'm not right. I think that uh, when you were selected resources, when you were deciding human resources, anyone that uh, deals with human resource uh, hiring looks for resources serving the needs of the corporation you are working for. Let me tell you that the corporation I work for picks up human resources in a very strange, obsolete way, and they are thrown into the pool. I am aware as well that the worlds are uh, very fast and uh, we hurry up to embrace the changes. I do understand it. But uh, we had the fad of uh, pieces, pieces everywhere, all around the place, mobiles every, everywhere next. And uh, my corporation does uh, foster these changes and uh, raises people's uh, staff awareness. But uh, perhaps it is too costly. I don't know whether it is good. What do you think about it? This uh, launching yourself into the swimming pool is okay, or perhaps we should plan for it before we jump into the, into the pool. Uh, it is not selecting people for a position. Uh, let me add this nuance. Though we deal with education, it is something that doesn't happen anyway in any corporation, in any cutting edge corporation, that you can pick up the best in class. You have a list of a, a team of people. A football team, a consulting team, a school team has deficits, weaknesses, strengths, and it is up to you as a consultant. It is not picking up people, but helping uh, people in the team develop. It is not uh, training, but coaching or keeping them company in their development pace. And the stronger the object, the stronger the team. Mercedes said that. I don't think that uh, the digital illiterate uh, teachers uh, can play a role in the future. I think that they can play a role if those who lead an organization, a country, a school, know that a team of 70, 80 people, amongst whom there are many people who can input many things, who, have ex who are experts in that, and the project should embrace it. If there is no team, there is no project. So all deficits get played up. Concerning digital resources around us, I met Adrian in a panel yesterday with industry leaders. Again, I draw the same analogy. If you are an implementer, life is easier for you. The industry is providing us with material, uh, with two things especially, uh, the strategies and the content. And on top of it, uh, industry packages it for us. I am a teacher. Last year, I told industry that I don't want to buy your strategy, but the content, please make it for me. I'll make my strategy with my educational project. Give me the content. If you are not an implementer, if you are a strategist as a teacher, we've made many mistakes. Myself, I, did, I committed a mistake. Just uh, uh, scheduling activities may take your whole day. If on top of that, of designing activities. You have to assemble to create the material for those activities to be uh, carried out. Uh, really, you are dead. You are exhausted to death. I, debate, I argue with the uh, teachers over making their own material. It is not what we are up to. We are able to do something with a higher value, which is designing the activity. Let's uh, uh, change our mindset about it. I ask the industry to provide us with contents that can be used in my design, in my target, as a teacher myself. Let me top off with the fact that uh, I've said it is two different traits, the implementer and the strategist or the advisor. There are six conditions to be met. If Catalonia 
was were a cutting edge uh, wealthy country if the school department uh, ha were very rich if we were free of fraud if I could be a decision maker which is totally unlikely I am just being utopian about it. We should decrease the workload on teachers and increase the requirement dramatically. This is my assumption. Since it is unfeasible, and you know that uh, I don't stop over that, technology must help us be more efficient in our teaching and not waste time doing things that add no value to uh, school. This is the worth of this uh, conference. It's on top of the emotional speech that we have to do this or that, uh, commitment, engagement. Uh, technology must help us, for instance. Uh, for us, technology is a tool uh, helping uh, students to work uh, by themselves in the school alone. If they work alone in a perfect world, you don't have to monitor them to stick them out. And you, can, for instance, can deal with younger children in elementary school, in primary school. And uh, therefore, let's look for a way for technology providing us with emotional support and supporting us in the less romantic uh, course of the day. And I think that we are still far from it. We are, we still need a good reaction from industry. We are on the right pathway, but we need to take a step beyond. Let me stress that uh, this is my question for you. Actually, do you think so because you lead an educational project, I think? Uh, let me tell you that I agree with you. Not everyone must be at the same level of digital skills, so to speak. But digital skill is a must for us to have. If you want to have a modern educational system actually reacting to contemporary needs in education, any corporation, any. And uh, I know that there are people in the audience who dislike it to be put uh, down as a company, but uh, since you were talking in the audience about a corporation I work for, I quote what you said. A company that is modern and cutting edge and uh, as uh, we are in education would never allow itself missing the best professionals, the best in class. Why does it happen with uh, education? Are we perhaps the poor cousin in the story, Cinderella? No. I'm not vehement about it. I am very radical about it. It's another issue which level of a digital skill. If you try to define what digital skill for teachers imply, first uh, is the adapter of technology and the implementer. Implementers, uh, well, not every one of us can be an implementer, but at least you, be, you should be an adjuster. You must be an embracer of technology. You can say that you dislike, that you hate technology. I agree with you on it. But I think that we, sh we uh, my approach is totally different when selecting, when hiring people, uh, professors in their late 20s, early 30s, when dealing with uh, uh, teachers that have taught for 40 years. I think that uh, uh, these people can carry on practicing, but not uh, uh, threatening the digital competence of our students. Our narrative. And this should be our narrative. And I insist on development. It is a must uh, for us leading teams of uh, teachers at any level of a schooling. This is our ethical must. Is that of helping the team develop and grow. A young newcomer should be requested to this because uh, he, 15 years later, will get a new and a new job, and uh, his her employability will factor in his her new position. Anyway, let me add that sometimes age, being more, being younger doesn't mean being an innovator. Youth doesn't imply being uh, technically apt. You may meet older, older people, not elderly people, excuse me, older people who actually are innovating, uh, innovating wizards. And uh, in the panel on digital companies, we dealt with the fact that probably we may need several profiles of teachers related to technology, which is a new nuance I'd like to add. The issue with our system as it is right now is that the teacher first teaches in the classroom. Next, off time, he is a technology embracer, implementer, cooperator, this and that. And uh, let's find a hybrid model. 
of professional profiles who spend time in the classroom, spend time in innovation, spend uh, spend time uh, dealing with other things. We spend so many hours in the classroom with 30 people in the classroom. We try to do your best when you leave, and this should be factored in as well. Next, the contents. It's very nice here talking about the uh, digital content, digital material. We are generators of contents for those materials together with our students. So let's factor students in this type of a debate. And uh, let's uh, ally with them. They have more time, they have more resources, more skills to use technology versus us. So fine, let's bring them in. Let's bring them into our team and let's try and set up cooperative team so that they can collaborate. I mean, the industry plays a role, of course, but not just the whole role. Things change fast, and therefore the school's assets, and I think that technologically we are resourceful, we have plenty of assets, let's try and do it. Technology truly facilitates. <laughs> I just wanted to steer us back briefly to the swimming pool. You know, I wasn't <laughs> suggesting jacking the teachers in, but when I, when I showed the analogy of the children, the point was they were much more capable than we'd understood them to be. And it turns out children can swim at six months. They can ride a bicycle at 18 months. And when we come into the school domain, there are things that children can help with unexpectedly well. For example, children peer support through marking. We know that. One of our Australian schools, for example, any child about a third of the way through their work always presents it to children who've already completed that work, maybe in a, an earlier year or an earlier time, and got a good mark for it. And the rule they have is a very simple one. It's easy on the author, tough on the content. So the kids present their work so far to their peers, and their peers are damning. You know, they really say, look, the best you're gonna get here is a D, maybe worse. You know, this is, I've learned a bit from your work, but it's not good enough, sort it out. And the kids always do sort it out. They listen to the wisdom of the other children. Now, the huge advantage here is it takes work away from the teacher. It reduces the task for the teacher. It gives them more time for feedback gives them more time for intervention. It's one of those places where we thought we could do all do it ourselves, didn't allow the children to do it. We're all collapsing with exhaustion from too much work, too much curriculum, too much marking, and yet the solution is in front of our eyes. 1927, Thurston wrote his famous paper about giving people, you know, you sit a group of children around a table with essays, and you say to them, pick up any two essays, judge which is the best and put them down. So this one is better, this one is better. All you have to do, take the mark scheme, judge the best essay. And at the end of 45 minutes, you have a better rank order of marked papers than if you triple marked it with colleagues. Now we've only known that for a century, but we haven't acted on it quickly enough. And I don't see a way going forward in this other than we look at what the kids are capable of and allow them to be capable more quickly. And that's why you're seeing a huge growth around the world of stage, not age schools. I've been invited to turn a university into a school in Australia. And I said, of course, it's a nice offer. You'd, you'd love to do it. North Shore of Sydney Harbour, um, state school, 3,000 children. So I said, well, I'll do it. But only if it's me, you're going to get a school that's got very long vertical groups. No, there's no year groups. There's, you know, there's nowhere else in, in our lives where we can't do anything until we're a year older. You know, if you went to the cinema and there was a row of seats for the 53 year olds, you know, it would be, would be dreadful. You know, children learning to play the piano, play as, as well as they can, as soon as they can. So only in schools we have this artificial horizontal thing. So I said, I'll change, I'll build, I'll turn the university into a school, but it's going to be a vertical school where kids can go as fast as they like. And we brought in for a big parental consultation these kind of numbers. We had about 2,000 parents, 224 children. I said to the children, the subject you're really good at, at what age 
do you think you could go to university to study it? So how many of the 224 children thought they couldn't go to university until they were 18? None. Not one child. So I pointed to a lad in the front row said, what are you good at? And he said, oh, I love English literature. I love it. And I said, OK, so what age do you think you could go to university to study that? Nothing else, just to study that. And he said, I could go now. Everything I've done this year in school, I knew already. I already knew it. Voice of the year. He said, in fact, I could have gone last year. I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 15. So here's a kid who could have gone easily off to study at 14. And I think we've got to open the doors to our children to see how good they can be, not just with technology, but helping us to design better learning, just like we did when we put them in the swimming pool and found, oh, good Lord, look, they can swim all along. They don't need the armbands. They don't need the help. But remember, to get six-month-old children to swim you still need a good teacher to show the parents what to do, to show them how to behave, to show them what the latest science shows about swimming. But you don't want a teacher who learns about swimming in the 1950s. You want a teacher who's kept updating their understanding as a learning professional. That's key to all this. Surely. I think this somehow took us to the personalized learning as well. <laughs> and with the, yeah, I mean, of course, all these themes are connected. And, um, yeah, I was also thinking, okay, we've been talking about learning together, learning with people. Um, also, we've been talking about sharing, creating together. And, and we've been also talking about teachers' role already, that it's... Um, what we would like to see is that there's more guidance and sca scaffolding. Yeah, and, more, and more collaboration. I mean, people, when people talk about professional development, they always talk about leadership, but nobody talks about followership. It's actually quite important to learn how to follow as well sometimes. Not everybody's a lead. You know, giving our children the lead to be researchers, to help choose the technology. You know, in, in my IPACA school, on the south coast of England, when we chose the technology to buy for the school, we asked the children what their dream technology was. And they said things like, it's got to fit in my lunchbox because that's the safest place I have in my bag. It won't get broken. So when, when we got there, when the big companies came in to sell us you know, all their shiny technology, they spent the morning with the children. And we said to them, I hope you've, I hope you've read the children's research because they're doing the shortlisting. If the kids don't pick you for the shortlist, we won't even see you in the afternoon. They're all shocked. But one of the kids, you know, they chucked out one of the big companies. I mean, tell you which one because I, I don't want to upset them. You know? <laughs> um, but the kid, the, the kid said, oh, we said, why did you throw them out? Because they're a big company. And the kid said, I asked them a question and they answered the question to my teacher. And I thought, if they're not going to listen to me now, they're never going to listen to me. You know, I'm, I'm in the driving seat now. They'll never listen to me when I'm just a kid. So I don't want them. You know, so they were really wise with their responses. So you have to give this back, some of it, to your children. You have to work with them to get it right. And all we know from putting the kids in the swimming pool is they won't sink. They absolutely won't sink. You know, we were wrong about their capability. They're better than you think. Thank you. Any comments from the audience at this point? I think we've been talking quite a lot and we would like also you to give a possibility to say. Well, um... Just quick show of hands. <laughs> Who in here is on Twitter? Put your hand up if you're live on Twitter. No, I reckon, I reckon, I reckon <laughs> if I ask that question in Australia or England at the moment, it would be about double. There would be, be about a quarter that weren't. So, you know, people out there are seizing the tools that they've got themselves to move forward. And I'd certainly point you at some of those social media tools to swap. Don't go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn's 
full of people who are looking for jobs. You know, go to Twitter and find communities of people who care about what you care about and do that. Really good, you know. But that was a low number of hands. How many people here have got... Just put your hand up if you've got kids in your family under eight. Kids in your family under eight. And when I say go, drop those hands if the kids have got phones already. So the kids have got phones already, drop them. So are you saying all the eight, everybody with eight? No, do that again. Hands up if you've got kids eight years or under. Just do that again. Come on, put your hands up. If your children are eight years or under, if you've bought them phones, put your hands down. Otherwise, leave them up. That's good, you see. That's, that's better than, that's certainly better than France or Germany at this point. So it's really competitive, all this. To see who's, who's running the fastest together as a community. What you've got is community. What you've got is shared values. What you've got is mutuality. You know, not many other people have got that. Uh, you know, most of the rest of Europe are fighting amongst themselves. You're not. Use it, blimey. Okay. Um, so, what about personalized mobile learning? Anything related to that? It's interesting when we when we spoke about well, well, when we speak about personalized, sometimes we confuse it with adaptive, and these are sometimes some concepts that. Well, for example, in a Horizon report, um, they use the word personalized. Personal, when it's something that the students organize by themselves, it's self-regulated, they, they organize their own learning. And adaptive is this something that the school or the system adapts. So it's, when we talk about personalized mobile learning, I, I think here the, the focus is on, on the um, self-directed learning, helping students to, to create their own learning environments, combine the things they, but, or, yeah. Anyone would like to comment? How do you see it? Merce? Um, I think it's important to have such a distinction. Um, I do think that mobile devices can contribute a great deal to customize, to personalize learning. It probably doesn't make much sense to speak about adapting here. Now, if we need to rethink what's existing, maybe that would be adapting, but we should not focus neither on the content nor on the definition of the process, but rather on the subject itself. Well, let me introduce one more thing here. We were speaking about the teacher before. Well, the teacher is always on the learning, and we seem to m lose sight of this. Indeed, teachers are citizens, are learners, and are practitioners and professionals, at least these things. So, generation-wise, we can assume the three roles, apparently, without much uh, concern, without much difficulties, without considering that they may be existing at different points in time simultaneously. And for students, I think that mobile technology has the added difficulty that there are no, not too much specific material created for the, these. And on that regard, maybe we should adapt, but adapting format-wise on technology to be used, then a thing as such as the screen size, something just as simple. If you shift from a large screen size to a smaller screen size, they will simply become useless. So that would be the first thing to consider when it comes to have a specific materials for mobile devices. But now, if we're talking about personalizing or customizing learning, which has been fashionable these days on the learning environments, the learning environments here, uh, mobile devices could play a role to, as an entry point for this personal space that we might create on the tools we might need, 
the way we need them, when are we needing them, what are they contributing. I think that part of the revolution lies in here, in this latest technology, that customized desktop, for instance, where you only choose what you need. And let me stress here that uh, one thing we have not discussed yet was the flipped classroom. And indeed, we are often doing more things outside the school than inside the school. One thing I, one notion I usually resort to is invisible learning in that technology often provides so many inputs that we are on an ongoing basis learning almost 24 seven. So the challenge is that this technology in our pockets eventually becomes our learning environment, our learning scenario with inputs and with different realities. One being the school, the high school or the university, the other being your own house, your own home, your personal, your family environment, then your interaction with the world. I move around in a world where I get permanent ongoing information inputs, for instance, let me confess, it took me one hour to reach here. Um, so I came in just as the Catalan minister was speaking. And as I was walking down the halls, it was like if I was in a different dimension, a different world, because the environment surrounding me was like close to a galactic environment, you know, neon lights, people in there. And... And this is something I'd like to convey here. How many things have I been able to look at? Well, very few, because there was so much information and I was not l looking at all. There were too many inputs. So if I were to be asked the companies I've seen, well, probably I've only recognized the ones I knew before. On one thing that stuck to my mind was one large screen with some sheets with turning pages, then the pages turning around, blank pages, and once you looked at it, there was a different drawing because they, uh, they were changing sheets uh, of paper. And I thought, this is the reality we have to work upon. The students are this blank piece of paper, but the truth is that their reality this piece of paper changes again and again. And the challenge for a school or for a teacher is how are we catering for this? And it's difficult to really know for each of them. So technology can be helpful so that each of them can be self-managed. And, and this can be done from a very early age. Just I think that customization has different views, different approaches. Customization should try not just at having, let's say, 30 students, but rather you have John and Mary. And John and Mary have different strategies, different learning strategies. And this was discussed precisely yesterday. John and Mary may have the B marks, but then the B mark in John might be out of a hard work and effort, whereas the B mark for Mary might be easily achieved by having just studied some five minutes before. So same marks, but then quite different mot strategies, motivational strategy on the one hand and demanding strategy on the other hand. So technology should be helping us fine tune this mark and to add some more input. Indeed, left-wing politicians, they always speak about motivation, whereas right-wing politicians tend to speak about demands. And precisely, w we, we need both sides of the equation. And gamification. Gamification has not been discussed so far. And it's indeed there is a motto from a pedagogue from last century saying it is a game for the student, it is a tool for the teacher. So a tool looking for the teaching, for the learning of John and Mary and gamification might be a good a good thing to consider. We know that there are different roles. There are players in gamification and they are motivated by the reward. Then there are the achievers 
and they are the ones trying to fulfill things, to achieve things. Then we have the free roaming ones, the, the, the ones that are looking for freedom. Then there are the disruptive ones. There are so different profiles in a technological environment where ga gamification is somehow included. This factor, other than what gamification provides, is this is a setting where you can have a personalized view on your student. You can have this personalized view on John and Mary. You can more easily fine-tune your strategy with them. And a technological context. key word here, though, really, is, um, is agility. Uh, and I think as teachers, you know, it's a windy day today. Uh, children in school on a windy day are different. The children in school on a day that's less windy, if they change. If, uh, if a child's injured in a serious road accident, the whole school is a different place for a month or two months. And, you know, I think when a school is agile, you can, you can be different things, you can be different people. Some of that is about the, the furniture and the layout, some of it's about the curriculum. As a teenager, everybody is trying to catch your attention. Your attention is one of the most valuable things in Europe. So coming into school and having to sit in the same seat on a Monday morning at the same time in the same desk, the same people on either side facing in the same direction, looking at a teacher who's probably wearing the same cardigan, you know, uh, for a year, for a year. Is, is impossible. You know, nobody, it's sort of pedagogic waterboarding, you know, it's just simply you couldn't do it. So how do we build agility in without it just becoming lackadaisical, let's do something different? And the answer is all about the quality, well, none of us are talked about, but we should, you know, standards. The reason why people are doing things differently around the world, because the data is showing Kids are doing staggeringly well. My school's Mark Oliphant College in, in South Australia. We opened three years ago. 3% of the children went to university the year we opened. And two years on from there, 37% of the children went to university. It's a massive increase. You know, half the children completed high school when we opened by 53%. Last year, 97%. Massive increases. The point about making learning more engaging you know, and more agile so it can cope with our nuances is the kids do better. You know, they do better as parents, as citizens, as workers. You know, think about Spain for a minute. Go back 100 years. Your kids were in school till about 14 and they were dead at 50. Now, you know, most children in school today will live to over 100 comfortably, but they're only at school until they're 18. So we've added a tiny bit of schooling and doubled the amount of time that they're alive. That clearly isn't going to work. They have to leave school seduced by the delight of, of learning. One of the really interesting things about Finland, if you look at the data, for Finland, which the PISA folk would describe as a paradox. Children in Finland emerge from school more competent in science than any, any other children in the world, but less likely to do science as a career than any other children in the world too. So there's something about the way in which they did well that's extinguished their joy of learning. Now, you've got to work on both. Because your kids are going to spend the rest of their lives learning to cope with the unexpected. That's why game-based learning is so effective, because it presents some of the unexpected. When you play a game, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Well, we weren't expecting volcanic ash clouds to close down our airspace. We weren't expecting uh, you know, climate change to be as rapid or as sudden. We weren't expecting so many things. You know, We have to prepare our children the unexpected. And the schools of the past, you know, children would leave the examination room or they'd come in and sit down and think, I hope there are no surprises on the exam paper. But actually, we should have given them as many surprises as we could to see if they could apply their science 
and their literacy and their humanity to those surprises. That's why the luck we have here of technology constantly surprising us and empowering our children is exactly what we need to give them some hope in the world going forward. Of course it's hard for us because it would be easy if nothing changed. But the fact that it's changing is what gives them hope. And that's what gives the world hope. So it's a pretty special time. And, uh, you know, of course, it's all about agility. That's the word, agility. Okay, Stephen, my friend, thank you very much. One thing that is not digital yet, digitalized yet, is eating food. So I think we, we really need to. Oh, it is that. in England. <laughs> in England, well, the food's I, I, I really we eat enjoy it that there's a balance, <laughs> balance between digital and physical. So we, I think it's time to go and enjoy the physical, physical part of this, this event. But anyway, um, okay, there were lots of things to talk about. And, but a couple of things. Well, well we, it's nice to finish with the idea of joy of learning and, and maybe the, finding the balance, not... We all know schools need to change, but, but little by little, with the good strategic thinking, planning, um, every school, every, every context is different. We're struggling with different problems. In, in Spain, you're number, number three, what comes to happiness at school. So I think you're doing pretty well with that, but then Spain has some other things to to work in in Finland, uh, school satisfaction is not so so great. We have really good results. So, could the word, the magical word, be actually balance? Could we try to find something? Do we have to be number one and then miserable, or or very happy but then no good results? So maybe with with I mean in all this conversation, uh, digital. Uh, material, physical, uh, using mobiles, not using mobiles, maybe just finding a nice balance and, and all of us like changing based on what we are, where we are at the moment. So could this be kind of a conclusion and then we could go to eat, <laughs> right? <laughs> all right. I think this is it. So now we clap our hands and go to have a lunch. Thank you very much.